All right, we'll give a couple more minutes for everybody to get here. I do want to thank everybody for taking the time out of your evening to be with us. We love doing Faculty Corner. Um, our faculty is always just so gracious and willing to step into these spaces, really to provide more insight for you guys, uh, provide a, a, a place where you can ask questions, uh, get better understanding, and really to, to connect with us We, as we understand how the world has changed in the last year or so. Uh, we really want to make sure that we're still having connection, that, that community is still important. So we'll we'll continue to do this as much as possible. So if you're just uh, jumped in here, feel free to say hello and tell us where you're uh, where you're calling in from. Don't be shy. We're all in this together. Hello. Hello. Yeah, this is Malaka from Ethiopia. Awesome. Welcome. Oh, Thank you so very great. much. Okay. What time is it over there? Uh, I think uh, at midnight. Midnight. Oh, praise God. Burning yes. the midnight oil. Well, thank you for making the sacrifice. We'll do our okay. best to make sure it's worth your time. Uh, in uh, Ethiopia, clock now, eight. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we are still having people joining us, but I okay. do want to make sure that we stay uh, in the context of our time, we want to make sure that um, we can get uh, Dr. Park to be able to share with us and um, we're going to have a good time. So um, I want to just say uh, a prayer for us and then I'll introduce our faculty guest, Dr. Park. And then uh, at, towards the end of our time together, uh, we'll have some uh, question and answer. So if during this time, you have questions, hello, hello. go ahead and jot them down. Hello. Hey. Hey, I'm called from Rwanda, Africa. Rwanda, awesome, awesome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, we're getting ready this to 1 a.m. 1 a.m. Oh yeah, my yeah. goodness. That's the magic hour. That's when the Lord is really talking to people, right? Sure. So we're going to just spend, uh, I'm going to open us, open us up in prayer, and then uh, I'm going to introduce our guest, and then we'll jump into um, uh, the presentation that Dr. Park has for us. Um, so thank you. Father, we thank you for this incredible opportunity. Uh, Lord, as so many uh, nations are represented here, Lord, we all understand that we serve the same God, and Lord, the same God of, of the United States is the same God of Rwanda is the same God of Korea, the same God of Africa, Lord. We are just so grateful that we are all bond, bound together by your son, Jesus. So, Lord, as we take this time to hear from Dr. Park, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, uh, for bringing us all here safely, Lord. We thank you for your arms wrapping around us, Lord. Increase our understanding, Lord. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a wonderful evening planned for you guys. Today, we have Dr. Park here, and Dr. Park is an expert uh, in Old Testament, biblical Hebrew, uh, biblical archaeology that covers cities as well. Um, he's joined here uh, at Gordon Conwell in 2011 as the assistant dean to our Boston campus. Um, he was adjunct at first, and then he has, has served as the dean at the Boston campus from 2016 to, to, to 2020. Um, his his um, Dr. Park speaks and preaches around the globe on top of the Bible, Israel, revival, and city. And he is also now uh, working in our Lat Latino and global ministries. And I am just so excited to introduce you all to Dr. Park. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Um, my time here in Boston would be a uh, good evening, rather. Uh, so uh, good to meet you all. Um, as Jonathan introduced, uh, I've been associated with the Boston campus of Gordon Conwell for uh, well over a decade. 
Um, and Boston is one of the very important cities uh, we have uh, today, uh, not only in America, but in global context. And uh, Boston campus is renowned for the urban ministry program we have developed and uh, shared the know-how across the globe. If you ever heard the, fr pr uh, the phrase uh, taken from Jeremiah, which says, pray for the peace of the city. That has become the catchphrase for everyone who does urban ministry today. And Boston campus of Gordon-Conwell was the place where that idea was first coined and shared across. So that's where I have served, uh, not only teaching in classrooms, but also being uh, actively engaged in urban ministry, uh, more specifically uh, in homeless ministry uh, for over 20 years. So at Gordon Conwell, we don't only teach and learn in classroom, but we actually practice what we teach and learn. So that's uh, my work um, over the past 20 years. And uh, as Jonathan has uh, uh, shared it already, uh, my doctoral degree is in Hebrew Bible and in uh, archaeology of Israel. And to briefly share my life journey with you, um, I was born in South Korea. I grew up in South America. I studied in Israel. I was missionary in Palestine. And then I'm teaching here in America. So I have been uh, around the globe uh, quite a bit. And uh, uh, I primarily teach in Gordon Conwell, but I frequently travel to different parts of the world uh, to teach. In Africa, the only place I've been able to uh, teach uh, there actually in person was Uganda. Um, but I'm hoping uh, to get to know more about that beautiful continent uh, in the future when God allows me to do that. Now, Dr. Now, Park, yes. A little birdie told me that you speak multiple languages. How many languages do you actually speak? So I teach and preach uh, in Korean, in Spanish, in Hebrew, uh, in English. But uh, by virtue of speaking Spanish, I also read Portuguese, Italian, French. So if you speak those languages, you can be in my class, you can write your paper in those languages. You can ask your question in those languages. Yes. I may not be able to answer back in French or in Portuguese, uh, but whatever you say, I will understand. Um, that's uh, about the modern languages I cover. Uh, there are still far many, too many more languages to learn. If God allows me the same blessing he granted uh, to Methuselah, I may be able to learn more, but uh, let's see. <laughs> yes. Um, I love it when I'm asked to teach Biblical Hebrew uh, in Spanish, for example. And uh, there was one time a student opened the door, saw my face and walked out because that was Biblical Hebrew course being taught in Spanish. And when the student saw my face, no, I'm in the wrong room. I said, no, you are in the right place. We speak Spanish here. Now, I don't know about uh, your journey 
to this moment where you are knocking at the door, potentially seeking to gain further understanding and growth in the knowledge of God and His Word. I don't know how and what led you to this moment in your life. But I would like to share a little bit about my own journey, not only in terms of the academics, but a journey as a believer and as a disciple of Jesus. Me having my doctorate from Harvard University and having served as the dean of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, sometimes misrepresents my journey in my growth in knowing God. Many people, when they read my bio, they will think, oh, that person must have been fortunate enough to have been given those opportunities to learn and to work where he is. That's not how my life began. When I was growing up as an immigrant child in South America, back in the 70s, the economic hardship my family was going through was so terrible that I had to drop out of middle school and start selling vegetable in the open market. In my life, I never dreamed of ever finishing the middle school. I never knew I would ever get an education beyond middle school. So what made the kind of changes that later not only took me to continue in my education, but specifically on education in the Word of God that puts me where I am today, that obviously has to do with the Word of God itself. When I was turning 23 years old, I had already completely lost my health I had overworked, but the economic conditions of my family was not improving. I had overworked myself. I had completely exhausted my own resources, my own will, and my own abilities to take from one place my family to another and I had completely given up on continuing living. That was 23. One day, God touches my life with the following words. They were taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, and it reads like this. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. These two verses, I had memorized them when I was nine years old, when my mother had taken me to Sunday school. I had completely forgotten these words until one day when I was 23 years old and I knew no longer where my life was going, God brought these words 
back to my memory and changed my heart. That was the turning point in my life, after which I started seeking to learn what this Word of God is about that lasts forever. I no longer wanted to live looking and searching after things that will perish, even at the age of 23. Is there anything that is really worth giving your life to that eventually one day, even if you were to give up on your life, what you worked for, what you strove for, the fruit of it will remain forever? And the answer was there. Follow the word of God. So that was the turning point. After many years, I had to uh, complete my high school education. I had to go to college. I had to go uh, and learn. Eventually, God calls me to become a missionary in Palestine. And then here now I am today teaching uh, as an Old Testament professor at Gordon Conwell. Tomorrow, wherever God takes me, that's where I will be. But one thing will remain the same, and that is I will be living a life that follows the Word of God, Amen. no matter where I am, no matter what I do. So that's a bit about how I am, where I am today. And uh, I am sure that each of you will have a story, a wonderful story to tell in terms of how God has touched your life and is now guiding your steps to explore this possibility of becoming proficient in the knowing of God's love and his love. So welcome not only to this session, but to the stage in life that you are at. And God bless you for, for that. Thank you so very much, Dr. Park, for sharing that. I think that sometimes people can look at, like you said, they can look at someone's resume, can look at someone's bio and think, well, this person's got it all figured out. Uh, that couldn't possibly happened for me. So thank you for sharing that, that God, when God calls someone, it doesn't matter where you are when he calls you, he's calling you. And just like Dr. Park said that he, he still had to go through the process of earning the high school, earning the college degree and going on to get his job. Everyone's got to start somewhere. And it's our prayer that uh, you find that place that God is calling you to start at. For some of you, some of you it may be Gordon Conwell, and we definitely have the tools to be able to, to help you. Now, earlier, Dr. Park, you mentioned that you had a little bit of a uh, presentation uh, about mm. the original languages. I love, I, I just love uh, hearing experts when it comes to original languages. So you guys are in an absolute treat to uh, hang with us for a little bit as Dr. Park reveals some of the uh, original languages to us today. Yes. So um, if you read uh, the lower section of my bio uh, on Gordon Conwell's website, I write something like this on that page. I consider very important the skill you earn to navigate in a world today which is so cross-cultural. hundred years ago, that was so rare. To be experiencing a foreign culture used to be so rare. Now in the 21st century, that happens every day. 
It can happen in your neighborhood. It can happen on your screen as you are browsing different websites. Jumping from one culture to another is now becoming kind of skills that everyone is acquiring and that is greatly uh, changing the ways in which we live and experience for the world around us. Now, in my bio, I say that same skill becomes extremely, extremely important when you are engaging for the world of the Bible. Why is that? Because think about it. Bible was written over a course of about thousand years. Thousands of years ago. In what language? First in Hebrew, later, later a mix of Aramaic, and then eventually Greek for the New Testament. Now, which of you here was born in Israel? Probably nobody. Sometimes I have one or two in my class, but normally I don't have that many. So Bible having been written in Israel, that already makes it foreign in terms of culture. Who of you here today speaks Hebrew or Greek as your mother language? Sometimes I do have people who speak Hebrew uh, in my class, but normally speaking, that's very rare. So both in terms of culture and in terms of the languages, the Bible is foreign to us. But because we grow up with the Bible and we hear the sermons week after week, sometimes it grows so familiar to us that we often forget that its origin is in a foreign culture and in foreign language. And therefore, we sometimes can fall in the trap of overlooking some of the things that would have been very clearly understood by the Israelites speaking Hebrew 2,000 years ago. That's why in Gordon Conwell, is, we so much emphasize the acquisition of biblical languages and exegeting the text appropriately. So what I thought I would do for about 10 minutes or so today is to exemplify what sort of different nuances are we able to gain when we approach the Bible from that perspective where we are conscious that the Bible was written in foreign languages to us and in the context of a foreign culture to us. Those two aspects. And I have here a PowerPoint of about of four slides. Uh, and uh, uh, Jonathan, do I have the ability to share the PowerPoint? Yeah, apparently I have. You should be good to go. Yeah, okay. So on this screen, you have a verse from Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, but the Lord God took the man, Adam, in other words, and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. Now, I purposefully left the parenthesis in blank, which will be filled with Hebrew words after. 
but now only read it in English. This is English Standard Version. So, after Adam was created, he was placed in the Garden of Eden. For what purpose? To work it, to work the garden, and keep it. For some of us, this already may be a point we sometimes overlook. A lot of modern day readers are so influenced by this idea of paradise that they tend to overlook this verse, which says, Eden was where Adam was put there to farm the land. When we look at it in Hebrew, it will become even clearer. But let's wait. Let's hold on that. In this garden, God places around Adam. God is not, uh, Adam is not alone there. God uh, brings to him uh, the animals, the, the cattle, in other words, the domesticated animals to uh, live around him. He eventually introduces to him uh, his dear wife. But together, uh, this union forming a family there um, and uh, uh, enjoying the, uh, the environment that God has created for them. And the trees, all the fruit-bearing trees that God planted there, the same chapter says, all those trees were good to look at and good to eat. Not only the tree of good and evil, but all the trees shared that same characteristics. Now, look at this drawing. This is an artistic visualization of a typical house in ancient Israel. Not Eden, but in Israel. People in David's, King David's time, would have lived in houses like this. Look at what's in that house. The places where the couple, the union of the couple would be living happily eventually the number growing as children are born cattle the domesticated animals are sharing the same compound there and in order to keep the space they've surrounded the household uh, with a little fence gate certainly is there and look at the fruit-bearing trees that grow around the house. Olive trees here, for example. It takes long time to tend it until it starts to bear good fruit. But once it does, the olives coming, growing in Israel are the best kind you can have in the world. Look at the vines growing here. Good fruit again. Good to look at and good to taste and eat. When an Israelite who's starting out to build, start his family and build his own life for his household. When the Israelite reads chapter 2, what is he reading? Is he reading a paradise that nobody knows about? No. What he reads in chapter 2 in Genesis is the kind of the house 
the environment where he and his family, with the blessings from God, will dream to build one day. In other words, Eden is the stream state of the place you would call everyday place. That's the cultural difference we have when we read Genesis 2, that's a far and distant world that was lost, shrouded in the uh, 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 concept of paradise for an Israelite. That's their everyday their life. The best of what their everyday life could look like if God's blessing is with them. That's cultural difference. Now, let's look at another passage. This time, Numbers chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, it says, And you, priests of Israel, so this is after the tabernacle was built, God says, And you, the priests, shall keep guard over the sanctuary, and the Levites are given to do the service of the tent of meeting. So here we are talking about a completely different context. The sanctuary, the tabernacle. How do priests do their work around the tabernacle? This is a totally different context, right? But now let me put these two verses side by side with Hebrew filling the spaces. What do you see? They are doing exactly the same work. What Adam was called to do in his everyday life in Eden they were exactly the same type of works that the priests were called to do in the sanctuary. If you only read this in translation, you will not be able to tell that. But once the Hebrew text is before you, the connection is right there. The only difference is the ordering of the two words. In the Garden of Eden, the task was to first work, in other words, first to farm the land, and then to keep it. Adam and Eve failed to keep it. When it is the sanctuary, now the order is first keep it, then do the work. Therefore, when we go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where we read, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's not surprising. Why are we being called priests when there are no longer any priests after the temple was destroyed? Why are we called priests now? Because priesthood in Israel was nothing more than God's design to lead us back to live like Adam was supposed to live in the Garden of Eden.
in other words the everyday place and that's why the reformers starting with Martin Luther recognized a very important pre uh, a principle Catholic Church was saying only a select group of people will be known as priests. But the reformers said, no, that's totally wrong. Now, every believer ought to live like a priest was called to live. In other words, the way in which Adam was first called to live in Eden. That you may proclaim the excellencies of whom who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The life that was lost in Eden now needs to be recovered. And that's not a special kind of living, different from how we live, no. It's doing what we do, farming the land, going to the office, driving your car. The everyday things we do, just like Adam was called to farm the land, but do it with the heart of a priest. Seeking God's honor and his holiness in every manner we do it. That's the call placed before us. And therefore, when potential students are exploring this possibility of study or not study in a seminary, I say, study. Don't even question that. Why? We are all called to live as priests. That's our destiny. There is no escaping from it. There is no excuse. So whether someone is um, considering going into full-time ministry or not, learning to live as a priest in, Israel, in ancient Israel was called to live. That's the real profession we need to pursue. Whether you are a teacher or a driver or an athlete, whatever the specific task you may be performing. So that's the conclusion of this uh, brief talk I prepared for you, which demonstrates the importance of recognizing the foreignness of the world in which the Bible was received by the ancient Israelites. And then also learning to fill that gap by efforts we take to study Hebrew, Greek, and different manners of interpreting God's word accordingly. Wow. Thank you so very much, Dr. Park. I will uh, never see that verse uh, the same ever again. <laughs> so thank you for preparing that for us. Um, we're going to um, jump into uh, some uh, Q&A here. So hopefully um, some of you have been um, um, thinking about questions that you would like to ask. I'm just going to give a little clarity in how, in how we'll do this here. Um, you can feel free to ask uh, Dr. Parker if you do have questions maybe about something in the Old Testament, if you have any questions about um, Gordon Conwell as far as admissions and classes and things like that, uh, I'm in the admissions department. I can help you with that. 
Um, at the end of this, if you still have questions, you can always email admissions at gordonconwell.edu and someone from our admissions team will answer you promptly. So we wanna make the most of our time here. Dr. Park has been so gracious with his time. So let's make, let's make it worth his time. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them at this time. All right, I'll jump in real quick. Oh, yeah. Go first, go um, first. Yeah, sorry, I had to pull the trigger first. Um, Dr. Park, um, yeah. I, I think my favorite translation of the scripture is the ESV and then the Christian, um, the Christian Standard Bible. So having said that, right, um, my, I've always thought, why is it that with uh, individuals like you, professionals like you and, and other scholars um, have done the groundwork and now we're standing on your shoulders? Why is it that they don't have translations that could easily um, explain things like how you did just a moment ago? I mean, have it, I mean, it might cost a lot of money to have text written like that, but why not have that as opposed to um, the arduous task of going and learning Greek and Hebrew? when we can just stand on your shoulder. It might sound like we want to be, I want to be lazy in asking that question, but I hope you understand what I'm asking. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, that's one of the questions we actually have to deal with in one of the, uh, in, in the course we call uh, interpreting the Bible. Actually, the first class session in that course actually is about Bible translations. And it comes to this uh, a simple fact. Languages function differently. And there is never a possibility to perfectly match the two different language systems. So the best thing that linguists could do, and I can say this confidently because I myself uh, 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 handle several languages and my sister is a professor of linguistics. The best thing that linguists could do about that is to come up with two different approaches. One is called formal translation. The other one is functional translation. Formal means word to word, literal. Make it so precise that this word will always be translated with that word in that language. But that has a limitation. For example, the English word party, political party or throwing up a party, a fun party. Depending on the context, the same word, even within the same language, can mean two different things. Now, functional approach, the message Bible is an extreme example of that. Translate the meaning rather than the word for word. But then if you want to do the word study with message Bible, it's a nightmare. You get the gist of what the author is trying to say, but you can't do a, 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 a lexical study based on those. So that's the human limitation that we inherit since the time God descended upon Tower of Babel. All of this can only transcend uh, uh, transcended uh, when we are in direct presence uh, uh, in front of our Father, Heavenly Father. But while we are speaking the worldly languages, that would not be possible, theoretically at least. But that's a great question. And ESV is an excellent translation. And ESV tends to be on the formal side. Oh, sorry. Just a little clarification there. It tends to be uh, uh, 
formal side means now it's because a lot of literal like liberal translation came out no uh what i mean tends to be is that nothing is only functional or only formal every translation is a mix of two and the question is to what degree is it formal and less of functional approach and ESB, ESV is mostly formal, but functional from time to time. Got it. Thank you for yep. uh, clarification. I'm Jin from Korea. You know, I was just born and raised in Korea and just moved to the US last year and started grad school here. I first attended Hamilton campus for my first semester because of the international student policy and then changed to Kyum and started like actually working there too as a part-time student worker. Oh, yeah, excellent. it's great to meet you. But like, since I've experienced Hamilton campus for one semester and then Boston campus, I could see the like different atmosphere. Yes. And then I would say uh, Hamilton campus is more academic while Boston campus is more practical and ministry centered. Yes. So thank you for your sharing of your like brief uh, history of your life too. So I was a little bit wondering like, Last week, I, when I first visited Kum campus, I saw your picture on the wall. It's like mm -hmm. previous dean, and then thought, why did like why did he why did <laughs> this guy move to Hamilton campus? Because I really wanted to see you, and I really wanted to see a theologian who's also practical. But I think like maybe you, I, I I'm not being too like judgmental or something, but yeah, <laughs> Hamilton is more academic, so I was wondering. Why did you change the course of your like life and position? Yeah. All right. Uh, that actually is not my personal decision. It was uh, uh, the seminary uh, that needed me in a different uh, uh, role. I am not part of Hamilton campus now. I am now affiliated with uh, a new program called Latino and Global Ministries program. And the main office of that program is located in Hamilton, but we are, we are a separate entity operating out of Hamilton campus, still part of Gordon-Conwell. But in this Latino and Global Ministries program, <clears throat> we try to uh, meet the needs of internet, not international, but whoever you, uh, wherever you may be, the students for whom English may not be the first language. So uh, within the Latino and Global Ministries program, or the short for it is LGM, uh, a lot of courses in the Old Testament there I teach in Spanish. Also, we have a, a, a whole new uh, a line of courses uh, that are only taught in Portuguese. We have uh, classes being taught in Chinese only. That's still independent, but eventually is becoming part of uh, the Latino and Global Ministries program. So uh, as Gordon Conwell is uh, growing, growing to uh, uh, meet the needs of communities outside of US or even inside of the US, now there are so many different immigrant com communities that uh, languages other than English uh, is needed uh, as the primary language of instruction. So that's the program we are uh, we we've started last year, and I am uh, uh, helping to uh, set up that particular program um, that is based in uh, uh, Hamilton, but. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, Jin was saying, there are four campuses in Gordon Conwell, and each campus is so unique. Out of Hamilton campus, we graduated students who later went on and became uh, professors in other seminaries. And you will note, notice that so many professors uh, uh, in seminaries across America and abroad 
uh, have been trained in uh, Hamilton uh, of Gordon Conwell, and it's a, a academically oriented campus, and uh, you ought to be. Why? Because students in Hamilton tend to be younger in their mid twenties, and they live on campus. They are full time students. They only study. How can you not be academically excellent? Hume campus or the Boston campus, on the other hand, is famous for the model of urban ministry uh, um, a paradigm, which we call Jeremiah paradigm. And I earlier on shared about it. Pray for the peace of the city. If you as disciple of Jesus are living where you are called to live, the community you are part of, not just the church, the whole community you are called to be part of, has to be blessed through your presence in their midst. Jeremiah was saying these words, pray for the peace of the city that to which God has taken you to as captives. Israelites were living as exiles in Babylon. And Jeremiah is saying, pray for the peace of Babylon. But because when Babylon attains shalom through your presence there, then your welfare will also be secured. The world, the community you are part of, has to know God's presence through you and has to become a better community because you are there. That's the goal of theological education at the Boston campus. Therefore, not while not neglecting the academics, the fruit you bear in the community, in the society you are part of, is considered the actual outcome of what you study, not the better grades, but the peace in the community where you are part of. That is the actual fruit you are looking for. So different educational goal there. That's Boston campus. Charlotte campus is known for two things. That's the campus that was started right from the beginning with the vision of reaching the globe through digital education. And secondly, that all the instructors who teach, all the professors who teach in Charlotte would have had some missionary experience before so that the appreciation of global cultural dynamics will be part of the education you experience there as students. So Charlotte is that. And then you have Jacksonville uh, campus in Florida, which now is known for the embedded seminary model. What's embedded seminary model? What if your class is now being held in the same community room where homeless are being cared for? So if you are having your Old Testament class in that space, will you not automatically be guided to think about what light this message has to share in that context? So that's not your permanent class, but you go there, meet as class, come back, gathered, 
gathered where people are. Retreat. Go and gather and retreat. The embedded seminary is what Jacksonville campus is pursuing. And in the Latino and Global uh, Ministry program, now we are part of, as I shared, we will actually offer the theological education in the languages you speak. So each campus, each program is so unique in Golden Kano. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, what campus are you in? I am Jacksonville. So we ah, are there Bay. you have it. Oh, yes. we hold classes. Uh, well, I would say pre COVID, but we were having classes in local churches uh, all across the city, um, which what that tends to do is brings people from all walks of life into a local church setting. And as uh, Dr. Park so graciously laid out to us, um, the goal, our whole goal here as a seminary is to impact the context of community that you are currently in. And so that's the reason why we are envisioning a seminary without walls, that we don't have to have a physical structure somewhere to be able to get access to seminary education. So yes, we are uh, full steam ahead uh, in the embedded and gathered model. I think we've gotten pretty close to our time here. What I will do is if you've got a really succinct, quick question that you may have, I'm gonna open the floor to one last question. And I see that Mr. Alimu has raised his hand. So because you decided to raise your hand, my brother in Christ, I'm gonna let you ask this question, all right? Thank you very much, Dr. Park, for sharing us with this life teaching story. Uh, I wonder, I'm, I'm Alamu from Ethiopia, actually. Uh, I'm going to join um, maybe Hamilton campus in the coming May. Uh, my question is, you know, I wonder you speak, uh, you are blessed with different languages, you know. Uh, I'm working with Bible translation. I always just struggle to even uh, have, um, uh, you know, uh, share your blessing, you know. <laughs> Let me say that. Uh, uh, if you tell us, uh, how do you just um, um, have this opportunity? Because you live, uh, you've, you've, uh, you have shared with us like you have uh, li been living in different continent, like in South America, Nurse, Asia, and also have uh, some experience in, in Africa. Is that because of that reason? Or did you work it just um, deliberately? <laughs> because yeah, we, as you know, we always struggle even to, um, um, you, know, you know, master biblical language even. And sometimes even uh, we are also blessed with different language here in Ethiopia. We, there is uh, more than 18 language we have. And mm -hmm. I'm working uh, with, uh, um, different, I like 28 different language, local languages as a Bible translator, uh, Bible translation consultant. Uh, I always just struggle even to uh, have some knowledge about some, okay? So how that happened? That's my quest first question. The second question is, why did you uh, just uh, prefer to missionary in, in Pakistan? Or oh, in Palestine. Palestine, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, in Thank not you. Pakistan, but Palestine. Palestine. That is very interesting to you. <laughs> yeah. Want to know. Thank you let very me, much. Let me briefly uh, uh, share that uh, since uh, our time is already up. Uh, after I finished my education in Israel, I actually applied to Gordon Conwell to become a student in Gordon Conwell. And I was accepted to Gordon Conwell. I was getting ready to come over. At that time, a missionary who had been working with Palestinians visited me and asked, could you help? Later on, Bethlehem Bible College, which was the place where Palestinian Christians were being educated. Not all Palestinians are Muslims. 20% of Palestinians are Christians. 
that college called me and said, we've been praying for three years for somebody with this kind of expertise, and we heard about you. If you reject us, there is no one else. Could you help? I was praying about it and God answered me. And the verse that God gave me said like this. The Spirit of God is upon me to preach the good news to the poor. To the poor. I said, God's leading is clear. I wrote to Gordon Conwell saying, I will not be coming to become a student with you. Instead, here there is a call I have to accept. So I became a tent maker in Palestine. I had no financial support from anywhere. And I stayed on for six years uh, to serve them. Uh, but God's providence uh, was so amazing. Later on, he called me to become a professor at a seminary. <laughs> I had to give up on coming here as a student. So uh, how I got to learn so many languages, um, that was not a vision I had. That was not my plan. I was simply... Once I uh, 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 started following God, uh, there was no other way. I just had to be where he called me to be. And uh, every time he led me to a new place, there was a new language to learn. <laughs> so you had to do it. But you know what? This is amazing. When I lived in Paraguay, in South America, Brazil is right next door. I couldn't understand a word in Portuguese, even though it was right there. Once I started teaching God's word, after I came to Boston, there are lots of Brazilian immigrants living in Boston area. The amazing thing is, I was able to suddenly understand the Portuguese they were speaking. Portuguese and Spanish are somewhat similar, but still not close enough. So you would naturally understand it. So I think there is some miraculous aspect about God enabling you to do it. But it'll happen as he uh, uh, considers it necessary as he leads you and once you give your heart to it he will enable you if not master it but at least to do the work you are called to do that that's my brief testimony about that Well, thank you so very much for once again sharing with us, Dr. Park. Thank you guys for joining us. We're a little bit over, but I just know that, uh, I don't know about you, but I've been totally blessed by this time with you all uh, and Dr. Park. If you could do us a small favor, Dr. Park, could you close us out in prayer? Yes, uh, let us pray. Uh, Lord, it is you who call us. It is you who teach us. It is you who send us. And it is you who make things grow. May this blessing, which your promise and your will, be upon the lives of all of us here gathered tonight and in the lives of those whom you are sending us to touch and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We look forward to seeing some of you at maybe one of our
next online events or possibly even at the student here at Gordon Conwell. You guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Jonathan. And nice meeting you, all of you, and blessings. Thank you right, so thank much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bless you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.